So, um, welcome everyone to the uh, Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly webinar with football practitioners around the world. Uh, this evening I'm joined by three fabulous academy sports psychologists uh, here to discuss the, the role of academy sports psychologists through the lockdown period and beyond. Um, before I uh, introduce you to them properly, I'll uh, quickly share with you the structure for this evening's uh, session and, uh, and how you can share your questions. So, you to use the old football cliche, it's gonna be a session of two halves. In the first half, we'll be sort of looking around the lockdown period. So hopefully if you could fill your questions in using the Q&A tab around the lockdown period, and we'll get through as many of those questions as we can in the first part of the uh, discussion. And then we'll be looking at the post lockdown challenges and the evolution of from remote working and, and to the academies coming back uh, probably I think sometime July, August from, from what the guys have been telling me today. Um, so, so that we can get to those questions, uh, let's crack on and uh, let me introduce you to each of our, my three guests for this evening. First of all, I'd like to welcome Amy Spencer, sports psychologist at Southampton. Amy, how are you this evening? Very well, thanks Steve, how are you? Yes, yes, very well, very well. Um, just wanted to, if you could just tell us a little bit about your role at Southampton, um, in terms of the teams you work with, um, the structure of the work and, and how, that, how you interact with the players and coaches. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Amy Spencer. I've been at Southampton for around eight years now. Um, I started off as an intern and I've kind of worked my way through the academy. So started off with the youth phase uh, sorry, foundation phase, then the youth phase, um, and now I predominantly work with the 18s, 23s and first team. Um, we are quite fortunate that we've got a department, but then listening to Philippa, we've um, got a very small department compared to Philippa. Um, so our department consists of two and a half people per week. So I'm the full-time member of staff. Um, we've then got our head of department, Malcolm Frame, who has been at the club for 16 years. So he's three days a week. Um, we've got Anna who works with the youth phase on two days a week. Um, we've got Amanda who is half a day with the boys program. Um, so she kind of is a supporting role and then oversees the women's program. So our women's work from under nines all the way through to the first team. So we support them as well. Um, and then we've got a clinical consultant that comes in two days a week. And then very fortunate to make up the numbers, we have two undergraduate interns. So we supervise them to help us deliver like group sessions. Um, in terms of what we deliver, we, uh, the academy boys, so from under nines all the way through to the 23s and on the women's side, so from nines to 16s, we'll have a group psychology session every week. So once a week, they'll have a group psychology session ranging from 30 minutes all the way through to 90 minutes. And then on top of that, they have additional like one-to-one -one support. So mainly with the 18s and 23s, it's more one-to-one. -one. I prefer working with them in a one-to-one -one kind of setting. And then we just have a very much an open door policy. So boys can come in and girls can come in and see us whenever they want to. Okay, thanks Amy. Um, keep it uh, ladies first. So. Um, but Philippa Jones with us from Benfica. Um, Philippa, it's great to have you with us. How are you today? We just need to unmute you there, Philippa. Yeah, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, how are you today, Philippa? I'm fine, thank you. I hope you, all of you, are also fine and yes, safe yes. period. It's all good where I am here today. Um, Philip, I just wanted yeah, if you share with us your bit about your role at, at the Benfica Academy and, and also how the sports psychology department is structured. Uh, yes, uh, I'm um, one of the psychologists of uh, Sport Lisboa and Benfica. Uh, in Benfica, the psychology belongs to human performance uh, department. Uh, the department has three main areas, the health performance, where are the medicine, nursing and physiotherapy, 
uh, Benfica Lab, where is the sport science and the sport dietitian, and wellness and development, where is the psychology. Uh, we have seven psychologists working uh, with football, uh, but some of them are not only with football, work also with um, other sports like handball and uh, basketball, hockey. Um, it's not only with football. Uh, so we have two in uh, under 10 to under 30. Um, we have four in the academy in, uh, since under 14 to B team and we have only uh, one in professional team. So in the academy, uh, each of us has two teams. For example, uh, I work with under 17 uh, and under 16. Uh, since the beginning of the season or a normal season, we start to work with, uh, with players. Uh, so we make a psychological assessment through questionnaires, interviews. Uh, we know what are the strengths and we define what we need to, to work with the, each player. Um, and we do this work through uh, individual sessions, team sessions, where we, meet, we make uh, direct uh, interventions. So we are present in all train sessions and the matches. Uh, we are in the field with the, with the team. Uh, and we do also a lot of work with the coaches. So this is the, the indirect uh, interventions. So we promote the psychological skills uh, of the players through the, the actions of the coaches, uh, their communication, their leadership, and so on. Um, a lot of, of the work um, in the field has also psychological goals. So um, it's like we look to the player through a lot of perspectives uh, that include physical, technical, tactical, uh, and psychological development. So all uh, of these components uh, are integrated in sport context and especially in what we promote in the field. So it's not like the psychologists work with the, the player, but also in the field, the, the coaches are uh, very aware of this, uh, this kind of work. Um, he, uh, we are very used to deal with the, the players. So the psychologist, it's a normal role, role included in the, in the teams. Uh, as the player knows that it's very important to work in the gym for their development, they also know uh, that it's normal to uh, go to the psychologist and is beneficial to promote their emotional and their mental skills uh, to enhance the performance, to keep motivation, to overcome adversity, uh, learn how to compete, to cope with pressure, uh, in the recovery of the injuries. So uh, all the work that we do are reinforced uh, by the coaches. Uh, besides the coaches and the players, we have uh, intervention with a lot of people uh, that are important in the process. The, um, the staff, since the medical staff, the um, social and educa educators, directors, and we also try to work with the families through workshops, education, uh, to give support when we identify that uh, the family or the players have some problems or specific needs. Um, I don't know if the, this, I think this can be an uh, uh, important part. Uh, we have um, a lot of players that live with us um, in, the, in the club. So uh, we have to, to ensure also the, the well-being and the, the mental health of the, this kind of players and the, these kids that live uh, with us. Okay, thanks Philippa. Um, and finally, we have Chris Bradley from Derby County. How are you, how are you today, Chris? Yeah, I'm good, thank you, I'm well. Um, yeah, I just wondered if um, you could share with us your, your, your role at Derby. I know you've not been there very long, you probably just came in at just the right time. Just the right time or just the wrong time, depending on how you look at it. I've been in about, I'd been in about three and a half weeks when the training ground got locked down. So just kind of starting to get my feet under the table, get to know people, get a feel for the place. And then, um, yeah, then being obviously working remotely ever since. So that's been, been tricky, but been, been a good learning experience anyway. What was your remit when you when you first came in? Obviously, I imagine that's changed, but we'll just focus on that. When you first came in in, in February, what was the what was the remit for your for your role then? 
Yeah, so um, when I came in, it was a it was a club wide remit, so all the way through from under nines to first team, and then some some stuff with the exec team and uh, organisational type stuff as well. Um, that's changed a little bit. It's still, but still, obviously a club a club wide remit. Um, and yeah, but I think mainly focusing on football specific stuff, obviously. So the um, the first team in academy football side of things was my my main priority obviously when I started. Um, so we heard from Philip and Amy that they were very much sort of hands on every day with the players and having group sessions and individual sessions. I and mean, was that the same plan for you or are you sort of very much kind of in the in the background? Yeah, probably more in the background um with Derby. There's already like loads of um I went in and obviously tried to do a needs analysis of the system and a bit of a system formulation when I went in and there was loads of great stuff already happening. So I didn't feel like, um, even though there's not, but I'm there, I don't have a department like, so it's just me, the psych department at the moment, but I um, sit within both first team and academy sports science and medicine departments. But um, there's some, yeah, there's some great people there already doing great stuff. So I've just tried to um, slowly work my way in rather than, um, you know, diving in and doing, tr- trying to put workshops on and, and do individual sessions where it might not necessarily be needed. So just trying to get a sense of how things already work and then um, build up a bit of a program from there. Okay, great. That's, uh, I guess that kind of brings us up nicely then to to March um, mm. and and lockdown hitting and I guess everything was going smoothly. Chris, you were just getting your feet under the table and then everything changed um or did it amy um other than having to work remotely in terms of what your goals were at that point how have they changed or how have you maintained what you were aiming to do prior during lockdown for amy sorry um so, I mean, it got very, very, very busy, probably like uh, Chris and Philippa. Um, so there was, uh, we ended up doing Zoom calls um, with all the players. So as a collective MDT, so multidisciplinary team, it was all of us collectively working with the players. Um, so, for example, an average week would look like Monday, a hit session from the strength and conditioning coach, uh, Tuesday, a pre-activation session with medical staff, uh, Wednesday, uh, ball skills with coaches Thursday they'd come and do um, a psychology session um, so my my PhD I'm currently doing my PhD at the moment specializing in mindfulness so I'm trying to embed mindfulness into the into the kind of culture um, and the organization within Southampton so all the players did a mindfulness session with me and then on a Friday it was more movement um, skills and everything so kind of more the yoga side similar to the pre-activation type thing um, so as an MDT, we we worked quite closely with the players, um, but it was also trying to build in that routine for them. So I don't know about uh, the other guys, but our players were kind of sleeping in until about 12 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> um, so it was trying to get them back into a regular routine. So it was that 10 o'clock Zoom session, uh, get up, kind of do your session, then go out and go for your run. Uh, we do a lot of online sessions in terms of team builder. Um, so their kind of individual individualized program was on team builder as well um, and then myself um, a player care team uh, it's kind of speaking to all the players so on a one-to-one basis uh, very similar to Philippa looking at their emotional and well-being side um, and just keeping them intact with that um, and just and just keeping an eye on them really and so that's kind of continued now with the academy we've gone into the off season um, so they've had two weeks break break um, and then we're going to kind of just reintroduce ourselves back in. I think it was quite nice for them to have that two weeks break away from staff as well, uh, just to kind of be with their family and everything. But that's all the way down to the under nines as well. So trying to put sessions, competitive sessions up on the the live uh, kind of hive page where they're doing uh keep you up challenges for the younger ones for example juggling for the for the goalkeepers so just trying to keep them stimulated that way um so yeah we tried to try to do it 
as best as we can and I think we've done quite well as a multidisciplinary team so okay thanks Amy we'll kind of dig a little bit deeper into all of that in a moment um sort of turn to, to you Philip and I wonder yeah, if you could share some of the things you've uh, you've sort of adapted to working remotely at Benfica uh, yes, the, I think the, the first moment was the preparation for the lockdown uh, because uh, during the last week uh, of train, uh, of normal train, uh, we knew, we decided that uh, uh, we were uh, about to lock down and we had uh, to send the players home. Uh, as I said earlier, we have a lot of players that live uh, in the facilities with us. So we had to prepare this moment uh, with, um, in a, a few days. Uh, and this was also a preparation for the, the isolation period and about the, the possible impact that this moment would have in them. So we have, I think, the, we tried to, uh, to work with them uh, before they go, uh, they go home. Uh, and we, we keep in touch with the players uh, as uh, we do uh, in, in a normal uh, moment of the, the season, but uh, through uh, Zoom meetings, as Amy said, uh, through text, uh, we um, try to uh, weekly to monitor all players. We talk with all the players uh, of our teams. Uh, we give uh, psychological first aid support for players uh, in crisis, for example, if we identify that the, the player, the level of stress of the, the player is higher, uh, we try to, to deal with this and to, to try to implement some strategies uh, for them in uh, uh, psychological uh, first aid support. Um, we also created well being assessments in the first month, they made this assessment uh, in two weeks. Uh, after that, one time per, per month, um, and uh, we, we share also simple documents with them, with strategies and tools to, to deal with this, uh, with this moment. For example, uh, strategies for try to keep mental healthy routines, um, to face this as a challenge and an opportunity, uh, to strategies for emotional con control, uh, study methods to deal with online and distant classes because this, uh, this is also a problem, not only the, um, the sport but also the, the school uh, is a problem not for them. Uh, they had to adapt to this new model. Um, and we had also uh, some programs in, the, in Benfica TV, it's the television of the, the club, but it's also um, a channel that is seen by uh, a lot of people in Portugal. So uh, we had uh, programs in the TV uh, to share uh, also some tools for the players and for the, the people that deal uh, with sport, but also for all, uh, all the, the people. Um, and we shared clips of these programs with the players uh, for things like uh, uh, dealing with the news, uh, uh, dealing with the, um, uh, with the social needs uh, and uh, the impact of th this isolation on them, uh, things like that. Um, and we participated in all team sessions, uh, the physical training sessions, social meetings, uh, we create challenges uh, in the team. Uh, as Sammy said earlier, um, I think it's it's uh, very close of your of your model, um, and we had uh, technical um, meetings with all the staff in the in the team uh, to give feedback of the the state of the the players, not individually, but uh, uh, what is the mood, how they are, what are we feeling about the the sensations the, that the players uh, are having uh, in in this week. And sometimes we had to develop strategies for also the coaches to adapt the, the sessions with them. Uh, for example, in the, the week that the players returned to school after the East break, we had to, um, to change a lot of things because they were uh, very, um, uh, they had a, 
difficult to organize the, the time uh, and the classes and the, the train and the meeting uh, teams. So we had to adapt a lot of things and we tried to give this kind of feedback to the, the people that deal with the, with the, the players. And this, I think this was also a good opportunity for us to, to develop uh, multidisciplinary uh, projects. In Befica, we have a lot of projects uh, during the, the season. And in this moment, we are uh, doing this, uh, this kind of projects to prepare the next season, uh, to prepare uh, what is the, the consequence of what uh, we are living and how can we adapt for the, the return process. Uh, and we have a lot of um, uh, meetings with the, all the, the staff from different areas to promote this kind of, uh, of projects also. Okay, thanks, Philippa. Um, finally, with, uh, with Chris, see uh, three weeks three weeks into the job and then uh, everything, everything changes. Um, what, is, what has been the, the structure of, of your work through, uh, through lockdown? Yeah, so I guess what, one of the things that was quite fortunate was in the first three weeks and managed to put in place um, some referral pathways, um, a, pol like a policy around mental health and wellbeing, and then um, some wellbeing groups. Uh, so we have a really, really good welfare team um, at, the, at the club and um, we put in place what weekly wellbeing meetings. So where myself, head of safeguarding, um, head of education, um, and initially player care um, would meet and discuss individual cases. So like I said, there was already some, some really good stuff going on. So that was about me seeing what the, the people there um, were already doing. So, but luckily those things were set up so that they, I think it was much easier to set them up than it would have been to do that remotely. So those things were in place. So it's kind of starting from there really. Like they provide, so the referral pathway obviously provided um, a good idea of how to refer in for psychological support. Um, and then the wellbeing group allowed us to kind of case manage any high need players um, or staff, of course, um, through, through this period. So that's kind of been the foundations of the work really is keeping those um, open lines of communication from players to coaches to us as a welfare team um, to, to making sure that they're open and people know how to access their support. So that was kind of the main thing was making sure there was awareness throughout the system of how to access support if needed. Um, and through that, what is the what are the types of support you found that you've needed to give? Yeah, so range of um obviously there was a range of cases on the the caseload from um some so some parental support being required to um maybe more um kind of low level anxiety stuff with some of the younger lads around obviously just staying connected to the program and um and not being in the building and being out of their normal routine and things like that so that they're the kind of things that I guess we've been we've been working around but it was very much a process of deciding who was best placed to have those conversations so whether we work through the coach or the um our head of safeguarding and uh, head of education both have um amazing relationships with all the kids throughout the academy so more often than not it was working through them to deliver interventions rather than anything directly from from me um so, but it was just kind of coordinating all that and, and working out how to get the right support to the right people. Okay, that's great. Um, see, I noticed that uh, Amy is, uh, seems to be writing down a lot of notes. Um, I'm sure she has a lot of questions for, for both <laughs> of you. Um, before I let her loose though, I'm um, just interested, um, Amy, in terms of your, tell us a little bit more about your mindfulness sessions and um, yeah, what you were, what you were working on there. Yeah, so um, I've been doing my, P I'm in my fifth year of my PhD and just trying to embed that mindfulness across the whole club. So not only um, for players, so for their well-being, but also out on performance, but also from an organisational level. Um, it's been quite difficult 
I have to say, doing the group mindfulness sessions with the with the players, um, purely down to the fact that you're doing it through Zoom, so you can't see them, you can't, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So when you're doing a mindfulness session with them in situ, you've got them all together and you, and you can kind of see and feel that and everything where when doing it on Zoom, it's been quite challenging. Um, so kind of going away from more of the group sessions, uh, I've been doing the audios, I've been up, uploading audios, not only for the players, but for the staff as well. Um, so all players can then have access to that and then listen to it in their own time, which they preferred. So I've had feedback saying that they preferred doing that. Um, on top of that, we've then kind of reached out to and put it on our website. So we've, uh, Greg, who's the clinical psych and myself, um, have just recorded some podcasts around mindfulness, the science behind mindfulness, how you can use it in practice. Um, next week, we're quite fortunate that we've got a colleague of ours from the States who we've embedded one of his mindfulness programs in at the club. Um, he's gonna come on and talk about mindfulness in performance and how mindfulness can also help enhance performance as well. Um, so we just try to not only use it for the players, but also put it out for the wider public as well. So far, it's been, it's been well received, I think. <laughs> okay, oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, uh, Philippa, um, I was thinking in terms of your working that you already had in place the the one to one sessions um, really strong structure to your work, but how was that then translated when you were having to work remotely with these players? The fact that you already had these close relationships with the players did it help in those one to one sessions, or it's still very difficult working via Zoom or or whatever digital platform you were using? Uh. I think it uh, uh, it um, helped uh, because uh, we are very used to each other. So as he came to um, to talk with me in a normal session uh, in the office or in the field uh, after the the train, for example, it's normal to talk and to say what's happening with uh, him uh, in this period also. So I think it uh, the relationship uh, that we had earlier. Um, was a was a, a big key for the this kind of work uh, in distance, uh, but of course this has impact because um, we are very uh, used to to have close relationships, and in Portugal we are very um, social and close, <laughs> and um, this is uh, uh, strange to be uh, not face to face. Uh, in front of the computer, uh, so it was um, a bit strange. But uh, uh, we we tried to um, to forget it and focus uh, in what we we have to to say each other and what is happening. But I think the first time it was uh, strange, uh, but now it's normal because it uh, we are in home for two uh, months and a half. So uh, now I think it's um, it's very normal, and I think this is good because when we return, we can have this kind of work also uh, in distance. Um, sometimes this happens not only in the lockdown, but for example, when I have players that go to national team for international tournaments, uh, they go for three weeks, for example, uh, and I keep in touch with them uh, during this period. So um, uh, we were, uh, it was like a practice for this period uh, because we had this kind of uh, uh, keep in touch when they are away in uh, another, another context. But um, in the first days it was uh, strange, but I think uh, after uh, a few weeks it was like our new normal, I said. I think mean, Chris, um, working remotely, I mean, it seems it could be obvious advantages for the, the coaches. And I liken it that prior to the lockdown, all the players were coming into the coaches environment. But now the coaches were being placed in the, in the players environment. There was having that level of engagement was, uh, the, you know, it seems that there was a positive there during this period to sort of engaging with players in their own homes, with their own families. Yeah, I think um, definitely from 
uh, well, definitely from the, um, the fitness and strength and conditioning perspective, I think they've um, managed to keep a pretty strong program going throughout this period and found um, creative ways for the lads to, in- to engage with that. Um, we also did um, a kind of video challenge where lads would send in some skills challenges or um, other types of things that they've been getting up to from a football perspective and, and stick them into the WhatsApp group. And that was pretty funny. There was some, there was some good ones um, provided by some of the lads. Um, we've done some Q and A's with first team lads. So first team lads that have graduated from the Academy and are now obviously representing the first team. They got involved and did some, we got them on zoom and they did some Q and A's with uh, the younger lads, like the, 10s and 12s and things like that which which went down really well and I think the parents quite like that too so yeah like you say it was just finding ways of engaging them in in their own homes and um and yeah I think using it to using the remote stuff to our advantage you can be you can be quite creative and quite engaging um and it's also interesting to see you find out a lot about the the lads when they've got to do something like that when they've got to be a bit creative or a bit um, independent in their thinking to actually come up with something and, and send it in. And then you obviously create that. You, you create a bit of competition between them just because they want to one up their mate and stuff like that. So it's um, yeah, that's, that's what it was about really. Steve was just finding ways of engaging the lads from, from their own home in, in different ways. In terms of that, we have a question here from um, Scott Murray. Uh, let let Amy answer this one first. Um, but what support did the clubs offer to the younger athletes' parents, given the anxi- anxiety levels the parents may have had around their employment and their identity? Oh, good question. Um, so we get, we like, like Philip has said, kind of carried on with our parents' program. Um, so. The parents program isn't just from the psych perspective you've got our life skills that uh, officer that runs that um, but then you've got kind of support from the sports science staff the medical staff and then obviously the psych so they have different kind of workshops um, there was a, a little bit of concern around that that particular topic so our clinical psych uh, did an online session firstly with the players um, so did the did an age group of players um, for half an hour and then did half an hour to 45 minutes with the, with the parents where they could ask questions so it was more individualized um, so we, we had that there so we, we wanted to make sure that the parents didn't feel isolated that they could reach out probably similar to Chris and Philippa that they, they could reach out and they could have that support if they needed it um, for me personally it was more about supporting those players as well because they could see their parents going through that um, potentially getting furloughed or losing jobs so it was kind of supporting players and and making sure that they had those coping mechanisms in place um, but to cut a long story short we put kind of workshops in place and everything for parents and for you Philip at, um, at Benfica uh, yes we some of the the papers that we made uh, the, the recommendations uh, were not f- only for the, the players, but also for the parents. We made some um, papers, uh, simple, for parents with tips uh, to deal with a lot of things. Uh, we, we feel that one big problem for parents here, uh, I don't know how is uh, there in England, but uh, here in Portugal, uh, the school has been a problem for the parents because the, they have online uh, classes, and uh, the parents, for example, they are uh, working home because uh, uh, in a period of time, uh, almost all the, the people were in home in uh, telework. Uh, so the parents had uh, problems to deal with this, to be uh, locked down uh, in home with the kids and the school uh, and uh, a lot of things to, to organize. Uh, and this was a, a big problem. Uh, we had a lot of parents that uh, uh, asked for help uh, about this. How can I deal with the, the schedules? Uh, how can I organize the, the time, uh, the social time, uh, the school time, the, uh, the train time of my, of my kid? Um, and some parents had 
also um, problems dealing with the, the boredom, the, the um, stress of the kids to be locked down home and can't go away. Uh, and uh, they ask for help sometimes, uh, mostly for uh, they, they call us and said, well, I'm very worried about the um, Paul or John or whatever, uh, because he's uh, very anxious uh, about this. Um, and we, uh, we understood that the problem was also the parents, but the parents said, well, the problem is the kid. Uh, so we tried to, <laughs> to work with the, the kid and the parents and to try to help in the organization of the daily routines and life skills and everything. Okay, thanks, Philippa. Um, for you, Chris, I've got a question here from Pateri Rasenen. I hope I've uh, pronounced that correctly from, from Sweden. Um, so he's an undergrad at Umea University and a, works in a psych, as a psychological consultant for VPS Vasa in Finland. So, um, the organizational stresses have increased both in variety and grade in the club he works for. As you can imagine, they have uh, increased for all, all, of, all of your clubs right, over the last uh, two months. Um, how have you balanced these stresses with the demands put on, on the players? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a decent question and, and one that we, um, we kind of considered quite a bit at, at Derby, which was um, given that this is a really difficult situation for the clubs, for the players, for their families, for the coaches. It was almost how do we approach it in terms of keeping the players engaged but not kind of overloading them with too much stuff because I felt like, or certainly there was, um, there was discussions at, at the start where it was it was almost like, right, how can we keep the players engaged? And we had exactly the same thing that Amy mentioned at the start, which was like lads sleeping until midday and then like kind of just lolling around for for, um, for for some of the time and then like get into the evening and being like, oh, I better do my run because I've got to do it today type thing rather than having any structure. So um, I think we tried to encourage lads to put structure um, into their day and uh, from a multidisciplinary perspective. Um, but almost not overload them with with stuff to do, and almost you know it's it's fairly it's seventy five percent of the way through the season when this happened. So allowing the lads to see it as uh, certainly the early part of the lockdown as a bit of downtime as well as having to stay engaged with with football. Um, because I think at at first we were chatting with um, someone from sports science, and it was they were doing probably more than from a physical perspective than if they're actually in the building uh, during lockdown because of the home program that had been set. So it was just trying to, you know, remember that this is going to be in the first instance, either really tricky for some or really exciting for others in a time just to kind of chill out and do some different things um, and maybe spend some time, more time with their families than they used to and, and doing all that sort of stuff. So yeah, it was trying to make sure that, um, there was a balance between the stress of the situation and not overwhelming the players as a result, just because they're not in the building, not feeling like that lack of control because they're not in the building turns into overwhelming them with things to actually like do rather than just chill out a bit. I mean, Amy, I mean, that is one, one approach. Um, I mean, if we talk about giving players challenges to overcome, um, yeah, this was one almighty challenge. Was there a kind of <laughs> temptation, maybe for a week or two? Just like, okay, let's see how you how you get on. Yeah, I'm just going to add on top of that. Um, one thing that popped into my head: we got a very good life skills team, and I think as a multidisciplinary approach, we thought right, especially for our scholars. So that's our 17, 18 year olds that are looking to go into end, independent living. Um, we thought, how can we enrol that? throughout the whole club as well and look at life skills to one keep the players kind of active because we did have a lot like Philippa said that boredom um but to take some stress off the parents so it was kind of can the players learn how to wash up can they learn how to cook a meal can they learn to do some ironing um and and different kind of skills that to work 
like work around the house and help out around the house which is also relieving some stress and pressure off the parents um but they have to film themselves to kind of bring it in um and send it across to our life skills officer and it also helped because when they're then back in the club they then don't have to prove that they're doing it at their host family we've already got the evidence so we can see if they're ready for that independent living there was an incentive that way to go well actually when you sign your professional deal if you want to live on your own you've got to be able to tick these things off it's going to help you on a long term so look at the long term goal but also it's going to help relieve some of that stress and pressure off your parents as well um so i thought that was a very clever way of <laughs> getting around and helping helping some of the parents out um, in, in terms of coming overcoming that adversity and those challenges it's it's i think it has been quite difficult not only for the players but also the staff um, we've got our first team, like uh, Philippa and Chris said, that we've got our first team that have gone back into training um, and they're loving going back in. And it's, I think it was, for me, I've written down that what this lockdown, lockdown has shown me um, and probably the rest of the staff is the love that these players have for football. It's kind of reignited that passion and how much they want to go back out and want to play. Um, and for me, that's kind of, been that cherry on top of the cake in terms of this this whole experience. Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, with with Philippa, I mean at Benfica, in terms of that transition with the with the younger kids, it's not so much in terms of them going living independently. Um, unlike, I would say, with clubs in England, you have um, a facility where I think it was about seventy young players or. All sort of sleeping in the in the same area, and you have like a, a residential place for all your players. What is going to be the challenges of bringing those players all back together under under? I presume is it one roof? Yes, uh, this can be a, a big problem. Um, we don't know how we can return uh, because we have to to wait for the. Um, DGS, it's like the, our health, uh, national health organization. Um, when can we return? Uh, because we don't know. Uh, and the federation doesn't decide it yet also because we are waiting to see how it's going, uh, going to, um, to be in the next uh, days. Uh, but this can be a, a problem because we have the facilities where the, the players live, uh, not all of them, all, of course, but uh, we have a big number of players that live there. So we have to, um, uh, to think about the, the new rules uh, to adapt the, this, um, this moment. So we don't know when this is going to, going to happen um, and how uh, we are preparing the, that, uh, that moment. But I wanted to say uh, two things about the, the, the question. Uh, one of them is uh, what we feel that are the main uh, stressors in this moment for the players uh, are about the, the absence of the, um, of the activity, of course, uh, because as Amy said, uh, they love football. And I think we are talking about the problem of identity of the, this, uh, these persons, because they live for football. The, the sport has a, a main uh, impact of their lives. And from one, one moment to another, it is, uh, it's almost uh, over. Uh, and this is a, a big problem for them, but also about the future. So uh, some players um, have thoughts like, uh, what is going to happen? Uh, can I be in Benfica in the next season? Or can I be released? Uh, do you say released when the... Yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so this is a, a concern for, for them and a lot of uh, our sessions is about the, the, the stressors and the things that they are feeling about the, the future. Uh, and also uh, one part of the question, I think it's about the, the stressors in the organization. Uh, for example, in Benfica, we... Uh, we work uh, uh, with all the professionals in Benfica. Uh, when the, this lockdown started, um, Benfica asked the psychologists to uh, give support to all the workers in the Benfica universe. 
because uh, for us, for the not only for the workers in football or in the, the sport, for example, the uh, sec secretaries, the laundry people, the 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 men who sell the tickets, everyone in Benfica uh, have this kind of support for uh, our department because. Um, a lot of people are feeling uh, very insecure about the, the future and this has uh, um, been uh, has a, a big impact in the, the people's life also in players in their families but also in uh, our workers that's a good point Philippa I know um, Chris your remit has been wide and out so you're also now dealing in some cases directly with with the uh, with the staff at, at Derby. I mean to kind of move that on, what are the challenges then you're finding as the first team are slowly working back towards playing games again? What are the challenges there, but sort of then taking it beyond for what is what are the challenges going to be once the academy teams come back, once the staff are allowed back into the building? Yeah. Um I mean the challenge is the challenges with the first team lads going back are probably we're trying to learn from obviously the, that experience to inform what we do with the academy lads. Um, so how it's trying to find out how they've found it, what things have been kind of stressful and anxiety provoking for them. Um, and um, obviously you, you're working with a skeleton staff that, that are only really where it's only really essential for them to be working with the players on the grass so that's um that's obviously quite tricky because um people that maybe don't spend as much time on the grass aren't aren't in the building yet either so um so i guess it's just the challenge of different people going back at different times and then capturing their experiences but trying to make sure that gets shared so that people who do gradually work their way back in have some um understanding of of what it's going to look like when they go back and I think that's probably that's one of the things that we're um, trying to put in place for the academy players and staff is uh, maybe capturing visually some of the stuff that the first team lads are doing so that um, there's a bit you know they're a bit more prepared for that when when it's time for them to come back into the building um, so yeah but the you know I think the first thing and I think it might have come up I seen one of the questions was um you know planning what are people going to be hesitant to come back in so that was definitely something that we had um with with some of the first team was you know worries about is it going to be safe what's is there going to be any is there going to be any risks and I think there will definitely be that and um, the medical team did an unbelievable job of um making sure as close as you know as much as possible and providing as much evidence as possible that it is safe to go back. Um, and I know after the first few days, the players felt a lot more comfortable with it. So I guess it's just um, demonstrating that again, so that there's that element of safety and that will obviously then reduce people's anxiety and worry coming back in. I mean, Amy, um, on a similar topic, I think sort of with questions here from Di Murray, Jamie Gilman and Lorna Harkins, kind of all around a, a similar theme. We'll start with Dai's question, which kind of sort of reverts back to some of the uh, approaches during lockdown. It, it sounds as, as though uh, different and new approaches have uh, been put in place to cope with the challenges of lockdown. So going forward now, which of the uh, new approaches will you keep going from what you've seen so far? It's a difficult question. Um, I think from the younger ones, the the interaction onto our online platform, so our Hive platform, has been absolutely fantastic and probably above and beyond our expectations of how much the players have interacted. Um, so that I think that's definitely, from talking to the staff, that's definitely one thing that's going to carry on. Um, and also just that humanistic level of speaking to the players in their home setting. I think Chris mentioned it, that that barriers dropped almost um, when, when kind of coaches or staff are speaking to someone in their own home without them wearing the badge and vice versa. So I think that's definitely been a massive kind of learning curve of 
how important and how much benefit that can have on players, um, but not only players, but parents as well. So I think that's going to be a massive, a massive um, kind of something that we're going to carry on. Uh, personally, in terms of what I've learned is that the online Zoom, I think I mentioned it before, the online Zoom sessions of mindfulness as just for me has not sat well. Um, it might be just of how I've delivered it or something like that, but I de definitely prefer just having that one-to-one -one conversation or doing it in small groups. Um, so it's just kind of re-highlighted what kind of aspects work for me and, and what doesn't. Okay. Um, Philippa, um, yeah, it was similar to, to, to this question from Di Murray, it was one from Lorna Harkins. Um, what are your plans for the next phase? Would be your approach and kind of new any new workshop topics that uh, you'll carry over from lockdown into post lockdown? Um, here we think the first uh, the um, we will not return uh, very soon. <laughs> we think uh, we are preparing for that. So uh, we think we will return uh, train in home. Uh, uh, and what we did in this uh, lockdown phase, uh, it's like a train for us in the first part of the, our next season. Uh, and also a big different, difference that we, um, we are thinking it's going to happen, it's the, um, the time that we can be in Benfica camps. Uh, um, maybe we have to prevent the accumulation of people, not uh, only of players, but also uh, of the, the staff, because we have a lot of professionals that work in the, the same space. Uh, so maybe we have to be uh, in different times in the Benfica campus. And I think this is uh, a strange thing for us, because in this moment, we are all, uh, all people are in home. But when we re return, we don't know when, but even in that moment, uh, uh, a part of the, the professionals can be in Benfica campus and another in uh, home. So I think uh, we can uh, begin the season with this uh, model that we had in lockdown uh, and uh, in uh, uh, the first uh, uh, weeks we have to test and uh, to, um, to make some uh, small steps <laughs> in, the, uh, in the, the phase of to return to the field, that is what all of us, not only the players, but uh, also <laughs> the professionals uh, want. So um, I think this, uh, uh, what we learn in this lockdown, we have to, uh, to go like this in the next phase. Uh, and during this period, as I said earlier, uh, we, we did a lot of projects, uh, multidisciplinary proje projects, and one of them, it's also about this. So we have to, to think, how can we work um, in distance with players uh, for uh, maybe another lockdown? Or uh, as I said, uh, when they are in national team, uh, when uh, they have a break, when they are injured, for example, uh, but they can go home for a period, how can we work with them uh, in distance? Uh, so this can help to, to think about uh, how we can work uh, remotely. Um, and we have, um, in Benfica, we have some apps and some uh, um, programs uh, uh, to players. Uh, some of them, we are making an upgrade or developing um, things to answer to these uh, kind of uh, requests to keep in touch. Uh, when they are uh, away from from us because we think for for example for psychology i think it's not the best best thing to to be distant but we have to to accept that this is going to to happen so we are trying to, to prevent uh, our or to adapt our behavior to this uh, to this new uh, normal <laughs> for us mm -hmm. I mean, Chris, um, so Amy's already mentioned that she's possibly not the biggest fan, but is, uh, is willing to adapt. I mean, how, what are you putting to a place to adapt to working remotely? How have you, how have you enjoyed working remotely? Has it been something that's worked for you on certain levels? 
Yeah, I think I think a lot of the anything that's kind of um, scheduled, I think, has worked pretty well. So anything that like so uh, maybe things that happen weekly, like the academy management team meetings or workshops, um, and um, so we've done a couple of workshops with the 18s and 23s, and they worked they worked really well. Um, then and you know your, your regular daily weekly meetings, I think they work really well. And if you can schedule one to ones and things in well enough in advance then I think that that works remotely um what I think I've missed is the kind of being in the environment and the things that you pick up on that aren't necessarily scheduled or that because obviously you're in a dynamic ever-changing environment in a football club so things are things are coming up all the time that you maybe miss when you're working remotely so it's those things that come up kind of naturally and organically that you maybe need to be a bit reactive to um that i'm probably missing a little bit or maybe feel i don't um you know i'm not as um i guess sometimes it's hard to be as reactive but in a good way if you know what i mean remotely whereas the proactive stuff i think you can that i think remote working is a decent replacement from from being in the building um, but yeah, that would be the biggest, that's been the biggest thing that stood out to me is that how easy it's been to transition from being in meetings to doing them remotely. Um, but then how picking up that live organic kind of that dynamic element of it is, is obviously tricky. Cheers, Chris. Um, Amy, I think, um, one plus point maybe from a coach's perspective, um, working remotely is that they get a real insight into their plays outside of the training ground and understanding the kind of dynamic of uh, their players, their families and, and how, how that works. I mean, how are you then able to translate that back in the future with when I can't presume there will be any, any parents in the future who will allow you to just yeah, come and put a camera in our house for two months and have a look at how we live. So how to keep evolving that with the coaches sort of, understanding that dynamic between the, their players, their home lives, their families, and how that plays into them as individuals. I mean, I'm sure it'd be very similar to for Philippa and Chris, that just from speaking last week um, with our coaching staff, they've very much found that just having those, being able to go into the players' house has built and grown their relationships with the players dramatically, more so than what they ever thought they could do. Um, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate with our coaching staff and with all of our staff that they've got that very much hands-on approach where it's all about player development and um, like we're trying to get 50% of our academy graduates into our first team and, and everything like that. So that relationship is there, but this has really shown how much more their relationship has developed. And I think it's just been a very much an eye-opener for all of us, not only just coaches, but myself as well, of going just by seeing that organic environment that they're living in and how like meeting their, their siblings and meeting kind of their parents and their grandparents and, and friends and that social distancing and everything like that, just kind of being part of their family has really helped. So I think that transition back into the draining grounds um, will continue if I'm being completely honest. Yeah, thanks Amy. Um, a question here from Chelsea Dempsey. Um, do you have any plans to do anything once players and staff return around capturing the challenges and learning points from lockdown and extended time away from the club? Um, I don't know if I understood the, the question, Steve. Okay, um, do you have any plans uh, once the players return? Um, mm -hmm that you'll sort of continue some of the challenges and, and learning points that you've gained from, from lockdown and this extended time that players have had away from the club? Uh, uh, it's about when they, if we are preparing something uh, when they return? Um, yes, but okay. I think, yeah, all the, all the things that you've, maybe some of the things you've been doing in lockdown that you'll then You'll keep them, you'll keep using them, you'll incorporate them into, into the, the structure of how you work 
once they they come back. So all the, the challenges, all the all the things that you've used to keep players motivated, will they will they be still part of of what you do, or are they very much remember that time in lockdown when we did this? So it would just be something you did in the past. Yes, I think one of the things that we are doing with them is uh, to uh, apply what they learn uh, in sport to this uh, to this moment. So it's like the transfer of the skills, the psychological skills that we we work uh, in sports to this moment. I think uh, when they return, we can do uh, the, the opposite. It's like the, uh, what happened uh, now can have a, a translation to, um, to the, the new period. Uh, and something that I think the, the perspective of the players that uh, the, the sport, it's a very important part of their life, but uh, it can't be the only, uh, the only project. Uh, we we have a um, a big struggle with our some of our uh, players uh, to try try to develop with them the the B plan. Uh, what can you do uh, besides the the football? Uh, and I think this is a, a thing that they are uh, living. It's uh, well um, in one moment the sport can um, be left behind. Uh, for a disease or for health uh, problems uh, and I have to think about what can I do besides football uh, and this is uh, th something that we try to um, to work harder uh, even harder than we do uh, in a normal season I don't know if you have this kind of uh, struggles also uh, uh, in your in your clubs but I think this opens a new perspective for the the players, but um, we think they when they return, they um, will return with the high levels of levels of motivation, the commitment because uh, they want to return uh, as quick as possible. Uh, so I think they will uh, return like uh, um, to as we say here, to eat the grass. <laughs> they, they want uh, to return uh, with all their energy. So um, I think we don't have this kind of problems when, um, when they are with uh, us again, uh, but we try to, to um, pick the, the things that they develop during this phase uh, and this period uh, and try to promote also in uh, in sports life because I think they they earn uh, a lot of things. Uh, some of them they don't have conscience uh, in this moment. Some some of them I don't have also because uh, only when we look for what happened uh, we can to to figure out what uh, what are the new uh, skills that they developed through this uh, stage. Okay, thanks, Philippa. Um, Chris, I um, was wondering, um, sort of talking a lot about the players coming back and coaches coming back. Um, for you as a sports psychologist, um, when there's a, a return to everyone in, into the building, how, how do you see your role evolving? Is you just going to go back to how it was, or has this period really put an emphasis on on the importance of the sports psychologists play within a elite performance environment um yeah i mean i think i don't know whether we're going to come out of it you know the importance of sports psychology is going to come out of it any greater than it necessarily was before so i don't think it'll i don't think it's done us any harm this period um in terms of people buying into the program i think um from speaking to other uh, well obviously before we came on live spoke to amy a little bit and some other colleagues that I've been speaking to in different clubs have definitely found diff um, ways of expanding their skill set and roles from this um, into different areas that they might not have been working in or might not have been their original remit so I think that's that's definitely helped um, I, I think it's still going to be about um, trying to help develop a culture and environment that is um, psychologically safe and, and gets the best out of the people that are in it but it's just whether that environment looks a bit different so like Philippa said we're probably initially um, 
having a motivational environment probably isn't going to be a problem to start with because um, everyone's going to be like so excited to get back that that's probably that you know that's not going to be something we really need to to worry too much about but then um what impact might the constraints have on people feeling supported if um they've got to turn up for training in their kit and then as soon as training is finished like get in the car and, and leave because the training grounds not open to that many people or you know all those sorts of things all those constraints that we're going to be working in is I think a, uh, a supportive environment that creates um, you know drive and confidence and um, good emotional regulation or whatever whatever it is that's still gonna the principles of that are still going to be the same but it's how much has the environment changed when we actually get back in that is going to dictate how we play our little role in that yeah. But, uh, Amy, I mean, I don't know how how far into the future you've looked looked into that, um, and what do you think possibly the sort of performance environment will look like at Southampton come the end of the summer? Is I think it's very similar to what Chris has said. Um, I don't think anyone really knows what it's going to look like or anything like that. You just got to do the best that you can do at this moment in time. Um, in terms of the players that we've got that have returned already. Um, yes, they found it a little bit daunting to go into, like I think anyone would, uh, going back to work or anything like that. Yet they're very reassured around kind of the support of the medical staff. So like Chris said, the amount of support and that secure environment that we're trying to create, um, it's not only for players, but it's for those staff to go back in as well. And I think as long as you've got that, psychologically safe environment that you're trying to create I, I i don't know how much we can plan into the future because no we, no one really knows what that future is going to look like so we've got to kind of take everything as it comes and just kind of prepare for all circumstances really yeah thanks amy um question here for philippa um another question from chelsea dempsey um what does your psychological profiling look like and how did that inform the support you've given during lockdown and throughout the season? Uh, sorry. Um, okay. uh, the answer, the, the question is about the psychological profiling of the yes. players? Yes. Is that? Um, yes, um, and how that informed the support you gave during lockdown? Uh, I think it was very important because, as I said, we when we we um, went home or uh, the days before, uh, the I knew the players, so I can maybe uh, think about well, this and this player. Um, can have some problems in the first uh, days, for example, because they uh, have uh, issues about the, the stress, about, uh, for example, the um, uh, afraid of disease, uh, like uh, psychosomatic uh, disorders and something like that. So I can try to, uh, to, know, to identify uh, the, the players that can have the, the most uh, difficulties to deal in the, the first times, for example. Uh, but uh, when it happened, uh, I think it was um, uh, funny because some players that I, I said, well, maybe it, it's going to be uh, difficult for him. Some of them in the first days, it was very good. They said, well, I'm very good. I'm with my family. I was not with my family for a long time ago. So uh, I'm very relaxed in home uh, and I, I was uh, thinking about, well, when, they go, when he go home, uh, uh, he's going to be very anxious about the, this thing. And sometimes it doesn't uh, happen as I predicted. <laughs> so, uh, but this is uh, very important because some of them, uh, I know that uh, um, I have to look closer uh, and uh, I don't I have to ask more times 
how is uh, how is uh, going uh, how does it feel um, because the the previous history uh, tells me that is in danger in this uh, kind of crisis for example i don't know if this was the 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 question <laughs> if it's not sorry um it was it was the answer that was uh that's the that's the main thing um and similarly for, for chris i mean chris at derby i know you coming in mid-season um and certainly with um fewer staff members working within the, the site corner as a, at Benfica. So how does that, how does that profiling work at Derby? How, how is that done? I'm still muted. Um, so we're, it's, it, for the academy players, it's kind of in its infancy, the profiling, obviously. So we've done some stuff at first team level using a tool called Spotlight, which some, some of the, um, participants might be familiar with the mind flick profiling tool um, so we've used that at first team level um, ideally we'll, we'll start rolling that out with the academy uh, players and, and staff pretty soon um, but we've also started um, or, well started gathering some of the historical information that staff and uh, that already exists within the system around the players to try and profile not in the maybe like performance profiling or personality profiling sense but profile as in like what does our history t uh, what, what does the historical information we've got about some of these players tell us about how they might respond to situations that they're in now and so that kind of information gathering process is, is happening to do a more I guess a more formulation type approach rather than a profiling type approach with some of the younger ones because there's a lot of um, really good information like in from with the academy manager or with the coaches and the the welfare and education staff like they already know the players inside out anyway so why not tap into that and that and get that real like um, bespoke um, kind of picture of what each player's life is like um as well as as well as profiling so i think for the maybe nine to 16 day group it's going to be more of a um collating information that we've already got and then helping that and using that to help us predict what challenges we might um might expect from them in the future and then with the full-time lads we might go might do that but then also have a, a personality profiling route using spotlight What's up for you, Amy? Um, I guess in terms of staff numbers, you come in somewhere in between Philippa and Chris. So, um, how is how are you able to uh, yeah, sort of profile players in the teams you work with, and, and how's that enabled you to work with them remotely? Uh, it's the same as Chris. Um, so we use it's very similar to Spotlight. We use Thomas International. Um, so we do that with our sixteens uh, all the way through to the first team, plus all of our staff. Um, so that's not only kind of our performance staff, but that's the whole organisation um, undergo that same thing as well. Um, so we, we've got that. Uh, and then additionally, we look at um, kind of our optimal performance framework, where we get the player's perception of their levels of cohesion, flow and resilience. So we look at those three things in collaboration with um, the profiles, the Thomas International profiles. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's go to the last couple of questions then. We can squeeze these in. I know we're running a little bit over. But, um, sorry, Calder, the question for all three of you. So uh, I'll let you decide who's going to jump in first. Um, how have you coped yourselves with the challenges posed by lockdown? I don't mind going first because I was going to actually, that's a question that I've written down for the other two. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I've had my ups and downs, if I'm completely honest. It's been a very much an emotional, an emotional journey, um, I think, because workload has increased quite dramatically, um, not only for me, for the other sites as well. Um, so it's really, it's allowed me time to get back into really utilising the meditation. So utilising that mindfulness and, and kind of bringing my sense check back. So being able to kind of use my anchor and, and coming like that so it's for me it's it's enabled me to 
enhance my love for mindfulness and why I'm studying it and practice what I preach. Okay, thanks, Amy. I can answer. Um, well, I think the, uh, the first uh, weeks of this, uh, this period, um, I think I, I felt overloaded. <laughs> when I came home, I thought, well, finally, I will have time <laughs> to do a lot of things. Uh, work uh, things, not uh, um, other things. For example, to dedicate to my PhD, <laughs> also that I'm doing also, but is uh, um, progressing uh, very slowly. Um, but this uh, uh, didn't happen uh, because in the first weeks, I think we we, we had a lot of work, the uh, normal work of support uh, that I described. Uh, but the adaptation to this uh, new um, process, um, our emotional uh, adaptation to all that was happening around us, um, and it was uh, not stressful, but with a lot of work. I didn't have time to think <laughs> uh, outside the, the things that I had to, to do. And um, this was a very tired uh, process uh, in the... I think the two first months, it was a, a, a strange period. Uh, now I'm more uh, relaxed <laughs> because I think I, I um, learned how to organize the, the moments. Um, and I, I try to, uh, to uh, the opposite of accelerate, it's this accelerate, no? <laughs> okay. Um, and now I think it's, uh, it's better because um, this, is, this was um, a problematic, but also I think this helped me uh, because I was very focused on the work and I didn't have much time to think uh, about what was happening uh, around the, uh, the, the world and the consequences and um, because I was focused on trying to help the others to overcome the, this period. Uh, so I think it, this was also protective <laughs> for, uh, uh, for me. So I have to, Amy, we have to talk about your uh, mindfulness sessions <laughs> because I think it's a, a goal for me <laughs> to, to start to, to do this uh, kind of uh, train also. <laughs> Chris? Yeah, I think um, like a lot of people, first couple of weeks just felt um, like absolute chaos basically and just trying to adapt and, and figure out what it's going to, what this is, you know, what it's going to look like. And obviously then you're kind of waiting on government advice and all that sort of stuff. So definitely felt quite out of control for the first couple of weeks. And obviously that can be quite um, stressful and anxiety provoking at, at the time and also yeah it seemed like there was a lot of extra workload got um, my role got expanded a little bit to cover some of the state uh, the staff I, we call them stadium staff at Derby because you have the two different sites the stadium and the training ground but um, the kind of ops ops staff and um, so trying to put supportive mechanisms in place for everyone at the club and 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 create resources that people can access to to help um so that that was something that became additional so that you know that was uh that was a an, an interesting project to to get stuck into but um wasn't exactly one that i expected to be doing so soon into the role so um so that was a bit tricky and then and then it's just been i think the um then you kind of settle into it and you get your structure and, and kind of the new way of the new way of working sorted. Um, I guess professionally, one of the biggest challenges for me has been connection, which I guess is probably the same for a lot of people as well, is just um, staying connected to people and staying connected to the the club and, and just the the daily hustle and bustle of a football environment, I think can um you know that sense of losing that was was pretty strong and to be fair like still is particularly as um some, a lot of the staff and the players have gone back and i feel a little bit disconnected from that is obviously a challenge um 
so yeah so that there's been a, i think everyone probably is going to say that it's been a roller coaster which is a, um which it definitely has um but i guess it's just always trying to come back to how do you stay connected how do you maintain a sense of purpose and that's the advice that i've been dishing out to the players so been trying to kind of take that on myself and keep my own sense of purpose and, and staying connected with people as well. Okay, before I let you go, I don't know, Amy, whether you had, I know we keep taking all the questions you were going to ask, I don't know if there was any questions left that you wanted to ask. Uh, there's, there's only one, it was more around um, kind of both Chris and Philippa mentioned it, in terms of identifying that player stress and how, how do they identify that and are there any measures that you put in place in order to kind of identify it even further? Um, so just on that one, nothing, I haven't put any specific measures in place to, to measure stress as we've been going along. Um, stuff comes up from wellness obviously that that might be that that might indicate stress whether it's sleep quality or you know whatever like some of the stress related questions come up on the wellness that we, that the medical guys um lead on um and then it's just and then from there the stress aspect of things is i guess just um working with the people that connect with the players regularly to find out if there's anything um that they might be saying stressful and then obviously just checking in um checking in rather like sporadically or you know with whatever frequency you've agreed um to see how people are getting on but yeah definitely they haven't put anything in place to measure it somewhat um someone in sports science talked about using the kessler scale um just just as part of the wellness which i think might be something that gets rolled out uh, now that the lads are having a bit of downtime just to make sure that we can keep connected with that but um that's the only thing i've heard in terms of measuring it from derby Uh, well, in my case, um, I think uh, I work on the feedback that the players gave me. For example, at the question, uh, a text question, uh, the how are you feeling uh, today or in the last uh, week, for example. Uh, about, uh, I uh, had in the individual sessions uh, through Zoom, um, video calls. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to identify also the some stressor that could uh, have been happening. Uh, and as I said, we we develop a, a, a short uh, assessment that we we gave him to to fill. It was six uh, questions that they put a number in a Likert scale. Uh, so to try to to evaluate the um, the the degree of the 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 stress that they are they were living in the different weeks of this uh, period. Thank you for yourself, Amy. Thank you both very much. Um, y yeah, we we use um, a mood scale um, and anxiety. So we use the GAD seven and PHQ nine that we roll out quarterly. Um, and I just didn't know if there was any other measures. But you guys have answered my question, so thank you very much. Yeah, I think I'll squeeze in one last question then before uh, before we wrap up. Um, and, and on a personal level, I mean, in terms of your own personal CPDs, um, you know, what have you learned about yourselves in the last two to three months? Um, start with Chris, I think, here and, and work our way around. Um, what have I learned about myself in the last couple of months? Um, that probably more adaptable than I expected to be um, and being able to come up with um, not necessarily perfect solutions, but um, quick so quick wins to difficult situations. Um, and again, bringing it back to the, the program at Derby, adaptability is one of the kind of cornerstones of our resilience program. So, um, so yeah, so try, trying to be adaptable where possible to, deal with whatever it was early on from either not feeling connected or the, ro the slight change in role or, or whatever um, and yeah I think that's been a useful bit of development is working on that adaptability to, to try and find a way what well, one to cope myself but also help others cope with the situation. And Philippa in terms of your own personal development what have you taken away from the last uh, 
two or three months? Uh, I think the one thing that was positive uh, was I think I'm uh, more skilled about the the, um, the reaction to an emergency. Uh, the as I said, the first days we had to answer and we have to solve a lot of things that uh, was uh, happening in this moment, and we uh, we were the the people that well. Uh, you psychologists, you have to to find uh, an answer for this, uh, a solution for deal with uh, that, and I think uh, this was a good train <laughs> for for me to um, to develop this kind of uh, a quick answer, the adaptability that uh, uh, we have to to develop in these uh, moments, and I think it was uh, very very good. I think. Um, I'm richer <laughs> uh, in this uh, uh, in this question, um, and I think other things that I'm I'm thinking it's I have to learn to develop the the skill to say uh, well I can't answer this in this moment because um, uh, we have to say uh, well. Yes, it's very urgent, but I have also uh, urgent things to do. So uh, I have to say no uh, more often. Um, uh, I think uh, it's something that I have to um, to uh, face the next stage <laughs> because this is not over. Uh, to um, I have to develop this uh, this skill of say no or say, well, I do this later <laughs> because now uh, I can do this or I don't have an answer for, for that. I think we, uh, and another thing, I don't know if how uh, you live uh, this moment uh, there, but for example, I have uh, um, a good support of my partners, of my, uh, because we have a team of psychologists and uh, sometimes we had to take, uh, take care of uh, of each other, and this uh, was very good. Uh, and I think it's um, something that we learn that we have to to take uh, charge <laughs> of the other uh, person that uh, uh, is working with uh, with us because uh, I felt that everyone um, expected that the psychologists. Uh, have to do something <laughs> about what uh, was uh, happening and what they were feeling uh, and sometimes we can uh, feel overwhelmed uh, with uh, with this yeah it's a, it's a great point who who takes care of the carers yes yes um amy for you um you say it's been a, it's been a roller coaster but on that roller coaster uh yeah what have you learned about yourself? I think it's very similar to Philippa and Chris. Um, for me personally, this last year, I've really tried to develop my leadership ability. Um, and I think that's really, I've been able to really focus on that, of being able to delegate, being able to kind of communicate more effectively what you have to, because you're not in person. Um, so having kind of, that ability to be able to put those skills into practice in a completely adverse and different situation, I think it's really challenged me professionally and probably personally as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippa. Thank you, Steve, for your invitation. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. And, and, and thank you, Chris. Yep. Likewise, thanks for the invitation and thanks to all the participants for tuning in. Uh, yeah, and finally, yeah, thank you to all the attendees for, for joining in uh, and putting forward some fantastic questions. Um, hopefully, yeah, we'll sort of see everyone here again next week on the Sunday session where, uh, yeah, I'll finish on a pun. I'll be in safe hand with a group of, uh, safe hands with a group of academy goalkeeper coaches. So uh, I hope to see everybody next week at um, six o'clock. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.